so I see this as a continuation of the previous session. I'm going to talk a lot about the swap internals and how we're going to deal with the uh, swap fragmentation and MTHP and the problem they cause, etc. First is the a review of the current uh, swap states or the data structure we need to keep and maintain and how it was used to do the uh, normal swapping. Whatever new system we are going to propose, this kind of information need to keep track of anyway. Or you need to have equivalent functions in order to deprecate the previous one. So uh, I'm not going to go through each one of them in detail, but uh, basically this is the often used, frequently used data structures. And a trend you can see is that uh, pretty much all of these, they are looked up by offset. The swap offset is basically the location of the swap file when the page right into the disk. And it's often used as a key to look up various of uh, data structure required by the swap system. And there's a quite a bit of like repeat key lookup. You see like there's many X-ray and, and stuff. And the reason is that some of these swap entries are optional. Like for Z-swap, your next entry might not be in the Z-swap all the time. So that's why they currently using the X-ray and various ways to insert whatever optional information you want uh, into the swap entry. But it's also a source of pain that the swap data structure is scattered all over the place and getting hard to maintain in a way. So the next thing I want to discuss, I want to hear like what was the communities, like other people's opinion on what is the pain point on the swap system. I heard a lot of talk about oh, swap is bad and we want to rewrite the swap. But the angle is like what do we want to get out from this rewrite? Uh, one thing is that the previous, like this data structure design, they are very, very space conscious. They even like make the normal counter as swap count. They take that into one byte and then they add this really ugly swap extension and stuff. So that in the normal cases, the swap entry only use one byte for the count rather than like very convenient eight byte and then you don't need to deal with the swap uh, continuous stuff. So yeah, does anyone have like any input? Like what do we want to get out from the swap system if we are going to like do a heavy rewrite or move to a file system and stuff. What was the angle we're going to get? Because for me, the existing system, how ugly and all that, like it's all subjective. But uh, I'm very, also very, I don't want to like do for the sake of doing a rewrite and rewrite. And I'm also feel very conscious like when you adding, when we're doing the rewrite, are we adding like uh, extra overhead for per, uh, per swap entry? memory or head wise. So I list a couple things. Can towards like uh, um, a better structure, but at the price of paying extra memory overhead. And we have to kind of like get worse before you can get better. Like uh, I, uh, I mean the, the current like swap map and all of that magic is designed around that you pre-allocate all of your memory, right? I mean, yes. there is no dynamic infra, like infrastructure. That's why you care so much about like only having one byte per slot because it's pre-allocated for your whole like swap space, essentially. Um, the, the, the question is like if, if we can move away from that and then not have to care about that, like we have to fit our like uh, swap count into that one byte and then have these extensions indicated via page flags and pointers to pages and stuff like that so m maybe we could even like in the in the normal scenario where swap is not getting used even use less memory if we just try to make use of dynamic infrastructure uh, dynamic allocation i don't know mechanism of course it comes with the price that if you're swapping out you might have to allocate memory, which is under memory reclaim, not what you might want, but maybe we can work around that. Because yeah, yeah, I hear you. Your point is that 
swap are either to be like normally almost no use. That's the case in my home computer or laptop. Like look at that, uh, the swap is pretty much unused. And then the pre-allocation is unnecessary. And then uh, only allocate what you use, and then you can allocate a bit more. And uh, keep that in mind that in in our like Google, they naturally have a huge percentage of memory are already swapped out in, in the Z swap, etc. So any memory consumption add to that will actually turn out to be like 0.1 something percent of the uh, uh, RAM in the fleet, and it can be something number that we actually care. Right, right. I think the interesting point is that if you care a lot about swap, you're usually using C swap. And in all other cases, you really don't want to go to disk, and it's just like a backup mechanism. So if we could find a way that if it's an ordinary swap device that we don't need that complexity, and for the C swap case, we can optimize it, I think that would be really nice to see. Oh, okay, perfect. And then that's actually the scheme I'm currently proposing for, perfect. <laughs> for, for this is, uh, let me explain a little bit. Uh, currently, we have the swap map, like contiguous pre-allocated as a counter, and to see which entry is free or not. If we pay one extra byte per entry, we can introduce a flag, and then we pack all the uh, swap entry together. Basically, now you contain the, uh, uh, yeah, swap map, but not contain, continue the uh, 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 swap C group. But yeah, swap C group and the swap map and the uh, swap flat, they add up to like four bytes. So we we pay one extra byte for the entry. Oh, do you still hear me? Oh, okay. So, and then we can have a dynamically uh, grow swap entry. Basically, you don't pre-allocate a swap map, but we use something like the, basically like the uh, a swap C group strategy we have uh, pre allocate a set of pointers and then the pointer pointer page struct. That page struct we internally feel as a swap entry. And then that way we pay one byte, we can get the swap flag, which will be useful for other things like the uh, compound swap entry I'm going to talk about in the later part. So if, and then in the problem here is that uh, the swap entry by that point is like four bytes. And if we use any pointer, it will, in the 64V system, it will become eight by, and then we get like four by alignment problem. So if we use the extra four bytes per entry, I propose we can probably using the uh, shadow swap entry, like the timestamp portion, store on that four byte, and then you can actually start placing pointers into the swap entry, like the folio, and you don't need to have a swap cache that use X-Array, like you can basically embedding what the uh, uh, swap cache want to look up as a pointer into the uh, swap struct. That's after we pay four, four bytes per entry. Of course, this will be dynamically grow. And if we are ambitious, we are allowed to take more bytes. Basically, we can do a lookup table from a small offset lookup to a pointer object. And then that requires extra eight bytes for six, four B systems. And then we can have something like a mem, a mem desk kind of the a structure. I call it like swap, swap descriptor and swap desk. And then we can actually add, dynamically allocate the swap structure, not just growing that for the fixed size. And then we can have different size of the swap entry with, uh, at a different offset. At the same time, the compound swap entry, they will share this entry. Like if it's 5112 entry all together, they are pointing to a compound entry, which I will talk about in the later part of the slide. All these entries, they don't need to have duplicate counters and, and swap, swap entries and C groups, et cetera. They can just share the same thing. We get the similar uh, benefit of uh, memory descriptor in the swap side. But we need to pay the A by upfront, but we are hoping we do a lot of compound swap entry and then we can save the memory back. And then, so the current state of the uh, swap, it's a one, 
reason change was that uh, MTHP get merged into MM uh, unstable, and it has both good news and bad news. The good news is that we can verify by this is works done by Barry Song on from OPPO. Uh, if we use large 64K uh, MTHP to do the ZRAM compression and then the comparison, the whole 64K together and swap them out as whole 64K, we get the compression rate improved by 19% roughly, and the CPU time dramatically decreased because you don't need to individually decompress uh, 4K page at a time, and then by its measurement, it's like saving 2.7 times on the, on the CPU time because it can decompress the whole, uh, whole 64B cage and then feed them to the app. You don't need to go through 16 of these kind of uh, page faults. But there's a currently already half a problem that the M, the, because we introduce MTHP, we are introducing a more severe fragmentation on the swap backend side. And uh, by his measurement, he's doing the, uh, uh, the app, switching between background app, randomly pick them and running at a, at a loop. Uh, at the first hour, the fallback, fallback means that you cannot allocate MTHP because the swap entry is not there or the memory is there, not there. But in this case, the swap entry was not able to allocate like the swap entry. The fallback rate initially is 14%, but after five hours, it's 90, 90% and basically become unusable, like 98 something. And, and the swap file, it's not running out of space. It's, uh, they have like less than 50% space use and and uh, I can show you more. It's actually caused by the swap fragmentation. And why that happened is like we look at how the THP swap currently does for the swap clusters. And we, when we designed the swap uh, cluster to do the large uh, THP swap entry, it kind of works well in the sense that the swap cluster size is the THP size. And then we use a per, all the zero swap entry, they will use a per, CPU swap cluster head, and they allocate from the cluster head, so that anybody who wants the THP swap entry, it's getting that from the free uh, cluster list. Because if you have one entry use in the cluster, you won't able to fit a, a MTHP anyway. So it's good that they uh, uh, have empty cluster, they don't care. But now, when we're looking at the uh, MTHP that are smaller than the THP size, it introduced a new problem that uh, uh, the, actually the half use or the partially used uh, 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 clusters, after, that's after they have uh, initial time allocations when they free, you create these clusters are uh, half use. And, and they can actually allocate MTHP from there but it's never the candidate for, for the allocation code to, to allocate from there because they, we haven't get that. So the MTHP will very quickly polluting the, the clusters. Like we end up with a cluster has a lot of them with like one or two uh, MTHP inside and causing the whole cluster was not able to allocate uh, for, the, for the MTHP. So basically, the half empty cluster, these are not considered as candidate for them to allocate uh, MTHP from. That's a problem in the current MM3 uh, need to be fixed. And then one way that I propose the shorter term fix for this is to have a allocator, have a better allocator for the uh, MTHP. Uh, a simple way that doesn't cause a lot of data structure change is basically we assign an allocation order to a cluster. We kind of does that right now when you're allocating a new uh, uh, cluster. Where every time you get a new block and then we use a per CPU structure to do an order and array, each array have like, each order have their own cluster to allocate from so that you don't, in a cluster you don't have mixed orders. And the, and we already have the empty cluster list, and we just need to have a list of the cluster uh, for those half empty 
uh, uh, clusters. We need to remember these clusters and then instead of going to the free uh, cluster look for them, we need to go to this like, half empty list before we, we will go to the uh, uh, free cluster. But this half its problem is that if you use a lot of 16K MTHP, like take up all the swap space, and then you convert a lot of them into 64K, let's say, and then you won't able to allocate because the, the ratio between the 16K and the, and the 64K are changed. David, a question. This is, I, I'm, I'm now a file system expert, but it sounds a lot to me like we want to allocate disk blocks just like a file system would do. And then we would also have like defragmentation yes. in place. Yes. So it, it, it all sounds like it, the problem has already been solved by file systems and we're in swap space, which is why it's weird, right? Yes and no, because uh, file system and swap have very different design goals and requirements. And file system are dealing a lot less with like per, we get back to the, the, the index key problem of the uh, swap entries and, and if we have a more complete proposal, we can evaluate that I did some like attempt myself, like try to use a file system, and I find out that the per swap entry overhead is a lot higher. I have no way to like reduce that overhead. Like it's, it's way beyond the eight bytes I, I want to introduce. Right, it, it's more like if we're already introducing like an abstraction layer, however you would want to call that, then that enables like to be able to defragment and have a smart allocator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'll talk about the, the other alternative I have is the, for the uh, allocators, yeah, in the, in the, in the follow-up slide. And long term, we probably want to have a body allocator for the swap entry so that it can address the problem that the uh, order are not evenly distributed, like they might change the, the order, the total number of swap entry in one order versus the other to solve the problem that you cannot allocate from the swap cluster for another order size. And the body allocator can help, probably help that. And uh, the one problem is that to maintain a the list for all the swap entry has overhead because you kind of need to have a, each body entry need to have a linked list. And the linked list is bigger than a typical swap entry. So the idea I proposed was that you have to maintain a window of the uh, uh, of the swap cluster that we scan and maintain this linked list. And then when we run out of them, we scan more. So we don't actually scan the whole uh, uh, swap file space to construct a, a full body list because that one can, can take a lot of metadata in, in between, like go up the, the, the swap entry overhead. But I would like to point out that uh, having the allocator itself is not good enough because the, frac the allocator doesn't contain, doesn't control the life cycle of a swap entry when it gets free and uh, when it doesn't. And the allocator can control where we allocate it. But if you have a evil user, he can like, for every 4K pages, so he fully allocate them. And then he can selectively free the one cluster have one entry or uh, for the body allocator, Z-bar, but like every other entry contain entry. And then you will still have like 50% of your uh, swap space uh, available, but not able to allocate any bigger than all the zero entries. So um, to, to address that problem, we really need uh, swap out non-contiguous swap entries when the allocator failed to allocate uh, uh, all the end entry. So here is what I propose is to have some kind of a compound uh, swap entry. And the simple case is what we currently have. It's just a contiguous swap entry and they are size aligned, natural size aligned. You remember the order of that, but it doesn't need to remember like, you, you will know the head, uh, the head entry, but that's kind of implying the cost stack. And then we can already start saving the swap, uh, swap entry space, so that if we have this dynamic allocate scheme, what I'll talk about in the, first, in the second slide, it would able to save all these uh, duplicate entry, the tail entry of that, like for example, if it's 
four uh, order two, and then the the last three you can map that to the tail, similar to a tail page like the tail swap entry. You don't need to store information for that because I have one already have them. You just need to share a pointer with it. And then the more interesting one is, oh, yeah, this is the folio, and yeah, folio have a very tricky thing is that the offset need to be order a lot size aligned and also contiguous. I think the alignment and contiguous doesn't make sense for from the file storage point of view. Why does a 64K uh, folio have to write to a 64K aligned offset, right? It's hard to find when you, when you uh, have a fragmented swap file. So that's why I want to propose, like, we, we need to allow the non-contiguous uh, compound swap entries and, and allow them to the swap cache to able to store non-contiguous and non-aligned uh, uh, swap entries. So I propose like this. Uh, maybe it will use X-Array or use the embed uh, pointers. Uh, those are implementation yet to define. But this is an invasive change to the swap backend code. Any feedback so far? I think that's the very like controversial. Will you're in for a world of pain with this? I mean, yeah. You look. You 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 you're basically reinventing a file system here. Um, and you're not a file system person, you're a memory management person. And we all know what happens when MMP people try to design file systems. We end up with a swap file system, which is terrible. Um, find, a, find an FS person to do this, really. Like, if, 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 this is, if this is something that we need, find someone with experience in, like, I have 512 byte blocks and we're writing out a four kilobyte page. How do I split it into, I mean, no, I, file, file systems do do like defragmentation under these circumstances, right? There's all kinds of strategies and tactics that file systems already have. I mean, we just covered this in the last talk, right? Yeah. I, I don't understand why you, you're trying to talk about this again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to show that with this, I actually can introduce a very minimum overhead because for the file system, we never actually have a concrete design. For I want to find out like what was the overhead for per swap entry, and I wasn't able to answer that from the previous talk. But on this, I'm able to tell like the how much exactly uh, memory overhead you are going to have. I, I can show you that this is actually fairly simple, and 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 uh, just do the necessary thing to do. Uh, I would like to like hear more from like technical perspective why this is not a good idea rather than like I'm not a file system guy. Yeah. So. I agree with Matthew that like all these kind of problems are kind of problems file systems are trying to solve. And I, I get your point uh, and I kind of agree that the, the file systems are not really written to like be saving so much on, on memory or basically on the overhead basically. And that's because managing all the complexity, like if you pro want to properly solve all these problems, then managing all this complexity has a cost and that has the overhead. And that's, that's what we are seeing in the end because file systems over the years have dealt to deal with all these corner cases and all the complexity and that you know adds baggage to the file system which you see. So. Like I'm, <laughs> I, I like I think that if you really want to solve all this properly, then then actually you will see that your overhead will grow as well. But like I have also another question which I wanted to ask when I was watching your presentation, and that's like currently we like want to, if I understand properly you, you like most uh, count with the fact that we are like swapping out 4K pages and then larger like multi-order pages possibly, yeah? Yep. So, uh, kind of did someone actually get some numbers how sparse the like mappings end up being after the swap out, you know? Like if we, you know, 
I would say, stupid idea, you know, but if we decide that 64K is the smallest chunk we are willing to swap out, uh, then how bad the memory utilization would get, yeah, essentially. Th that's the basic idea. And now I understand that probably the overhead would grow too much if we decided that if we are going to swap out, then we swap out at least like 64K, or some kind of swap around or whatever. Uh, but, you know, if someone tried to get some insight into when we are actually swapping out some mappings, then how how fragmented actually this is going to be. Because my intuition would be that actually, you know, you have these parts which are relatively heavily used, and then you have like relatively large parts of of the anonymous memory which actually don't get used at all. So uh, you have like relatively large contiguous chunks which you get, could just swap out as one object, let's say, which will then cut down the overhead and cut down the uh, defragmentation problems and all this stuff, essentially. Yeah, if what you describe is true, and then the short-term like swap cluster ordering strategy will actually work out pretty well for your scenario. Basically, if the, the, uh, the ratio between the, the yeah. low order one to the other, other order, as long as that ratio maintains the similar, and then these short term solutions are fairly simple to implement yeah. compared to the other ones. And, yeah, and so, so that's why I'm asking, because if you bound the problem like this, then you don't have to go to the full complexity. And then actually, you know, some special solution is kind of more feasible, seems more feasible to me. Uh, but that, that's the question I have. Also, also, like here you kind of mirror that basically when, when you have some, you know, when, when the allocator has decided for a particular size of a page in memory, then you kind of mirror it in swap out and then swap in, if I understand right. But that's not necessarily needed, yeah? Like you can decide to swap out more, similarly as you can decide to swap out less than, than what the allocator has originally decided to allocate as, an, as a page order. So, and this, this can give you also some wiggle room to battle the fragmentation and ma make the stuff more efficient and, and so on. I totally agree and it's actually my plan that uh, I want to separate the, the the swapping strategy portion is that do we swap out a large page or do we swap out a smaller page or do we swap in? In the swapping case, it probably need more like tuning, like not always the best way you swap in the whole uh, yeah. uh, uh, large folio. Yeah, yeah because but, basically file systems do all the all these kind of tricks, you know, like with page write back and stuff like this, because you know, swap out is kind of a page write back, you know? You can view it, like the principle is the same, you have something in memory, you, you are writing it out to persistent storage, and then you can reclaim the stuff from memory, yeah? So, so it's, you no, know, there are similarities. I, I'm not saying it's, it's exactly the same. And exactly file systems are playing these tricks like to, you know, do, do stuff in large chunks, you know, to optimize the performance and, and so on. So, 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 you know, this all seems like very similar to, to what, uh, and, and these tricks actually help, like they, they help reduce the overhead and, you know, the fragmentation and stuff like this, so. Yeah, um, in the current strategy, I'm going to propose the fragmentation. It's not going to be a problem anymore if we have allowed this contiguous uh, uh, swap out. And also, I fully hear you, like the fastest is very much like anomalous memory, but I would like to point out that their working set behavior is quite different. That's the reason why MGLIU have specially file portion with anomalous pages. They, they use different LIU pages to track them and because they behave differently and the needs are different on, on the anomalous memory versus live file. Yeah. And Luis, you have a question? Yeah, yeah I, I agree that there are differences between how how the file basically mappings are used and between how anonymous mappings are used. And I am no question of about that. That's basically why I was asking for some numbers about fragmentation and so on because I, I believe like that that actual numbers are going to be different than from what we are used to from the file system world. Yeah. So I agree that you know there are there will be significant differences there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I should mention that um, future drives will also have a, a larger alignment requirement too. So 
um, we will need to consider that for where you're placing these folios. And from the file system perspective, we already deal with that in the page cache. So you will also need to consider that for future uh, swap, you know. So I, I think that, uh, I think it's a good time to rev revise that with that in mind as well too. So, so any order alignment requirements from the backing device too. That will have a, an implicit requirements on swap, future design implementation for the swap. Look. I think it's a really interesting point, Lewis. Um, we, we really need to consider what we're going to do when we have uh, four kilobyte folios in, of, of anonymous memory and then a 16K. Right, so we, we are in the world now where we, we will have drives that, that essentially will, it's part of specifications and so forth, right? Hence the large atomics too, you know, and all these other things too. Um, especially if you're dealing with power fail considerations, just you know, think about like the, the future roadmap of hardware, right? We will have these things, you know, being important. Um, but yeah, the, the, this work uh, in a way is dealt with in the page cache. So it'd be interesting to see how we can leverage the alignment work uh, that is already solved in the page cache for swap. It's not clear to me exactly how, but um, I, I would suspect that maybe the, you know, some folks has already thought about some of these things. Well, no, I haven't really been thinking about it too much, um, but it, it, it seems clear to me that if the minimum size that you can write is, is 16 kilobytes, then you've got to swap out four pages at once, uh, as a minimum. Yes. Um, so that, that, that's, that's kind of interesting, right? And I think it's something that, that the MM people probably haven't done much thinking about, is you know, which other three pages do you swap out along with the one that you really wanted to? Um, yeah, just the next one on the LRU. Someone from the ether. Oh yeah, sorry, uh, disembodied voice. Um, I was going to say the next one from the LRU. Like we can just batch, right? We're already reclaiming them, um, you know, in batches. If and the LRU grouping is also probably more predict uh, more predictable of what's going to be used together than, you know, say like a, a non VMA or a file relationship type thing. So if we if we grab you know as many pages from the LEU as we need in order to fill the batch and then send that batch off in one go, then I think we can do both the um, the, the grouping and the I/O size to in, in 16K. Yeah, I think you're right. And and then when when we come to swap in again, the minimum I/O size is going to be 16 kilobytes. So we'll bring in all four of those pages at once. And then we'll pick out from the swap cache the one page that we wanted. So it, it, it's, it's still going to be really interesting. Yeah, it will be pretty interesting. I haven't thought about that. But now you mentioned it, I think there's some, probably can have some more interesting design to allow like the, the right back block size are bigger than the your our folio size. And then you might be able to like batch write more than one folio at the same time to one back end, like things like that. Yeah. I haven't like considered that in my current design yet, but sure. it's a very good point. And then, but it is another argument in favor of decoupling further from the, the between the MM and the swap caches. Yeah, just 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 let the the swap file system take care of this kind of uh, con concern, and the MM probably needs to not be terribly aware of it. Uh, yeah, I would like to see, as I said previously, uh, I, I like to see a more complete like, file system oriented way of design, and then we can have some concrete thing to compare with. And uh, in the current this proposal, I, I, I thought about this, and then this should be, from this diagram, you should be able to implement, the, the, make the necessary change to, to implement that uh, without being too hard. And David, your question? Uh, do, do, do you, I think the next slides you had where you had like this folio and then you had multiple entries, what was it that one? I, I, I'm wondering if we're in, introducing too much complexity and if that complexity is warranted because like ideally the granularity at which we swap out shouldn't have to be the granularity in which we swap in. For example, simply because like we, we decided at some point we only got a 32-bit THP and another, I don't know, four kilobyte after that, that we swapped out 32 kilobit, but maybe on swap in we can just make use of 64 or 128 or something like that. Um, at, at which point I'm asking like, 
why, like, if we run out of, like, contiguous swap entries, why not split the folio and swap out and it's going to be gone and on swap in, you know exactly, like, what is my local area, I can, like, fold around that area and I can just, like, collect uh, yeah. all of the different pieces so you don't have to maintain that information simply on swap in you say well I can also swap in a 64 kilobyte so I'm going to collect the blocks and do that and for example if you bypass the swap cache it's absolutely no problem uh, if we have an exclusive anonymous page which is, which is like 99.9% .9 of all cases to case we can do that um, so that, that's just like what I'm asking if, if, if we can get around that by splitting in these cases where we run out of memory and then fix it up uh, during swap in yeah I, I have one better it's basically as if you split up the uh, uh, swap pages to write them out, but without actually splitting it. Basically, that's this is what this is trying to get to. And also, I want to point out one assumption that it's not correct, that you don't have to, with this scheme, you don't have to uh, swap in the whole uh, large folio when, when you have a page full. And this design allow you to, like for example, you have the second one, have the page full, you only want to swap in the second one, you end up doing, look for, look for the swap, a strong entry, and then you go through like which, which one, and, and then you, you already have offset, you, you can just swap in that one. You don't actually need to look at the Kanban swap entry. So it's, it, I would like to decouple the policy part versus the actual like swapping. As a library, I want to able to swap in and swap out large folios, but do we always swap in and swap out large folios? Not necessary, so I totally agree. Yeah, just technical note, we are kind of already five minutes over, so if you can just go Yeah, I think somehow. that's the last page uh, and the reference, yeah. Yeah. So this is the, the simple way I designed that use a compound swap uh, structure and then just have a way to track its sub-entries so you can have the com memory compression effect when you uh, reference them, you just use one pointers. And that's it. Any more follow-up questions or the next one? All right, no more questions. Thank you.